All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. I thank you so much for joining us today. And um, just before we begin with this workshop, I'd like to apologize for having video issues as I am not able to show myself today. But thank you so much for joining us. Yes, My name is Asi Please make sure that your mics and videos are off at all times. Um, today, we are joined by um, our esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Sherry, who will be um, doing this workshop for us. Just before I'm going into detail um, regarding um, our, our facilitator for today, um, the topic for today is focusing on formatting the large documents in MS Word, which is going to be a hands-on workshop. The workshop um, will be done by Dr. Sharon, as I have indicated. Um, Dr. Sharon Clarence is an honorary research associate in Chetel, as well as the CPGS. But her day job is doctoral training manager at Nottingham Trent University in the UK, where she creates and manages a university-wide program of events, workshops, and seminars for doctoral candidates and supervisors. Um, friends, colleagues, we are really blessed today to have um, Dr. Sharon sharing this space with us considering that we actually asked Dr. Sharon to do this workshop at such a short notice, as you may have seen in the, um, in the advertisement that we had um, Neil Kham, who couldn't make it today because he hasn't been feeling well. I'm just trying to make sure that a lot of people are being admitted. I mean, also just a reminder colleagues to make sure that um, we run a smooth workshop um, our cameras and our videos must be, and our, um, and our mics must be off at all times, and we'll get indication from the facilitator if um, we will be given any permission to speak. So welcome to all of you. Um, do enjoy this workshop, take notes, learn and unlearn. This is a very open and educational space. So without wasting any time, Allow me to call upon Dr. Sharon Clarence to continue with the workshop. Welcome and thank you very much for placing us with your presence. Tom. Thank you very much, Asipe. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to see some familiar names and faces in the room and also some new ones. Um, it's very nice to be back in the Rhodes University space. Um, I left in July last year and I haven't really done very much since July last year. So it's lovely to be back. Um, so it's a pleasure to be asked to do this. Right. So what we're going to do today is, um, and I have to also start with a bit of a caveat that I'm um, not, okay, you can all see what I look like now. So I'm going to stop my um, video to also protect the bandwidth. I am not an expert in Microsoft Word. I don't really have any qualifications. I haven't done an MS Word course or anything like that, but I have worked, um, well, I've worked on Microsoft Word. I produced my own thesis on Microsoft Word, my master's and my PhD thesis on Microsoft Word, both very long documents. And I have worked as a proofreader and copy editor, helping other, the other thesis writers um, lay out proofread and, and format their theses. And of course, I do help my own um, postgraduate students that I supervise with this. Uh, I've also worked as a journal editor for a long time starting out as a production editor, which is essentially somebody who does all this fiddly stuff, trying to work out what people have done with their formatting. So this is something that I've certainly used a lot myself. And so what I'm sharing with you today is things that I've learned along the way. So the first thing that I'm going to say is one of the ways in which I've learned how to do a lot of these things is also by asking the internet. The internet is um, both fantastic resource, resource and a very frustrating place. Um, but there are a lot of very good YouTube videos at the moment that exist. People who actually work for Microsoft who make YouTube videos and people who just 
understand how frustrating it is to be pressing something on a computer for half an hour and thinking, why am I wasting my time doing this? So they've made videos to help you not waste your time and figure out how to do things. So one of the things that you should really get used to is this idea of, I don't know how to use this. Let me first ask YouTube and see if there's anybody who's made a video, because most of the people who do that do what I'm going to do today, which is a screencast. They actually show you on the screen what to click and where to click. The other thing that I'm going to say is that a lot of what I've learned has been learned by trial and error over the years, and I don't always get it right. I'm hoping that I'm going to get it right today because I have this audience, people watching me do it. But it is also something that you sometimes do just have to be willing to deal with a certain amount of frustration dealing with these tools. You have to remember, Word is not a brain. You have a brain. Word is just a tool, and it's a tool that has limited programming. So there's certain things that it is not programmed to do, even though you may need it to do those things. Um, there might be people in the room who have heard people say that Word is not the best um, program to use to compile long documents. I had a debate about this with the PGR I was working with here in a workshop last week. And some of them were saying, no, you should use Latex, you should use Scrivener, you should use other things. I'm not going to go into those debates. I'm going to assume that we're all using Word, whether we like it or hate it, and we're going to try and do the best we can with the program that we have at our disposal. Right, so before we start, I'm using Microsoft Office 365. So I'm using the latest version of Word that came with my subscription that I bought in 2020. I have looked on my husband's Dell laptop, so I'm working on a Mac, but I have looked on my husband's Dell laptop, which is a, a Windows PC, and his version of Word and my version of Word are both Office 365, and they both look fairly similar. You may be working with a slightly older version of Word, whether you're working on a Mac or whether you're working on a Windows PC. Um, so some of, the, some of the things might not be in exactly the same place as they are on my screen. You might have to click around a little bit, and then you might have to go to YouTube and say, actually, how do I do this on Windows 10? Or how do I do this on Windows? I don't even know. Is there a Windows 11 now or 12? I'm not sure. The last one that I heard about was Windows 10 because I haven't been a Windows user for a while now. So that's also just to say as a, as a, a caveat that I'm not working on, um, on any other version of Windows other than the, one, the latest one on Microsoft Office 365. Um, if you're working on a machine that you have access to on campus, you should be working on one of the same kinds of versions because most universities have updated these things. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to actually work on a document that's a published chapter that I wrote um, and published a few years ago. And it's, I can't do it any other way. I have to work on a document that actually exists. So this is the plan for the workshop. So the first thing we're gonna look at is how to set up a template in Word before you even start writing. This is going to save you an enormous amount of time because one of the things that students often really struggle with, especially when you're writing a long document, um, whether it's a master's or, um, or even whether it's an honors long essay, um, which has different chapters and different sections, but anything where you're going to have to start dividing a document into chapters, dividing it into sections, and then chunking those up and then writing it over a long period of time, a year for an honors, what, well, six months three months actually, if you look thinking about my honors, I think I wrote my honors thesis right at the end of the year. But ideally you have about a year to work on the documents. You have a couple of years, maybe three years to work on a master's and you have between three and five years to work on a PhD. So you write this thing in bits and pieces. And if you are using different templates every time you write, when you come to put that document together, you're going to have to do an enormous amount more proofreading. And you're gonna to have to fiddle with silly things like, here I used 1.5 line spacing and here I used 1.15 line spacing and here I used some other kind of line spacing. I can't remember what I used. And sometimes you'll have six points of spacing before and after headings and sometimes you'll have none and sometimes you'll have eight. And so all your spacing will be a mess. And it, there is a huge amount of value in spending time really getting this kind of stuff right and using the tools that are available to you to make your job easier. Because if you hand in a piece of research that you've spent two years working on, three years, four years, five years working on, and it looks sloppy because this chapter has got these kinds of headings and this formatting, and this chapter's got another porting, this chapter's got big spaces, this chapter's got small spaces, and you know, you've used the space bar instead of the tab key to move things, it's going to look a mess. 
And what it's going to say to the examiners isn't this is an incredibly professionally produced and, and careful piece of research. It's going to say, I don't really care. I'm just handed in whatever. And nobody in this room thinks that about their work. But unfortunately, that is what poor presentation does tend to communicate to the people reading it. Even if actually that was nothing in your mind about that at the time, and you just were really struggling to work out how to use Word. So if you don't know how to use these tools, please use the resources on the internet. And then if you still don't know how to use them, please ask people for help. Because the most professional document you hand in is what you want to hand in at the end. You don't want to hand in, obviously, there'll be a few typos and mistakes because we're all human. My thesis had typos in it. But when you look at the final version that was published in the library, you can't really find too many mistakes with the formatting because I used these tools. So I'm going to show you about page templates, pa inserting page numbers. In connection with that, we're going to look at how to do breaks, page breaks and section breaks, which are going to help you control the, a, a long document, um, especially if you have to make edits and additions. We'll explain what breaks do. Um, and then we'll look at the automatic table of contents. I don't know if we'll have time to look at captions. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm currently fighting with the auto captions feature because it's not quite working the way I wanted to. So I think I need to learn maybe how to do that a bit better myself before I show you how to do that. I am in the process of watching YouTube videos about auto captions myself. Okay, so here we go. First of all, we're going to look at page templates. So in Word, what you'll do is you'll go to the top um, where you'll have file, edit, view, insert, format, tools, table. You, you'll have a similar version of this if you're working in Windows. There's always a button called format, and there has been for a long time. It might not be exactly here, but it will be somewhere, right? So you're going to click on format, and then this drop down menu will appear. And what you're looking for is paragraph. Okay, so format, paragraph, and you're going to click on paragraph, and then this dialog box is going to open. Now, I can't actually see the chat because I've made my thing full screen. So, Asipe, if there are questions and things, please interrupt me. And can I just ask, can everybody see my screen? Can you see my Word document? Can somebody just yes, visible yes, yes. Okay, good. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so then this dialog box will appear. Now I've set up my page templates. So this is what my page template is for my typing my Word documents. So you start off with the alignment. Alignment is when you look at a page and either all the lines go all the way across from the left hand margin to the right hand margin and it's sort of beautifully squared with both margins. That's what justified means. Okay. Um, you can also have obviously left justified which means that it's only lined up with the left-hand margin and the lines will be jagged. You'll have right justified, which is what you do when you're writing a letter and you want to move the first address over to align with the right-hand margin of the page. And then you'll have centered and everybody knows what that means. It just aligns with the center point of your page and then all the typings in the middle. You want your text to be justified, right? Your final text must be justified. Outline level will say body text, leave it as body text. Okay, then, if you are typing a document where you think, I actually want there to be like a full space between each of my paragraphs, then that's what indentation should look like. No indentation at all on the left and right margin and no special indents. But if you are typing a document where you think, I, I quite like it when the first line of every paragraph jumps in a little bit so that it's very clear where a new paragraph is starting, what you'll do is you'll come here to special and you'll say you want a first line indent and the default setting is 1.27 centimeters which is pretty good you can leave it as that okay you can then obviously type and try it and if you think that's too big of an indent you can come back here and make this smaller or you can come back here and make this larger and look at the bottom in this dialog box it'll show you what that looks like right so if you say, I want half a centimeter, you can see, well, that's not a very big indent. Maybe that won't work so well. Actually, let me try a centimeter. Yeah, that's quite nice. One point half, oh, no, that's too much. Okay, let me come back to okay, 1.2. That's what I want, right? The default setting usually is one and a half lines, line spacing for these kinds of documents. Um, one and a half lines, especially, okay, so you guys have really got to think, somebody's going to have to read this document these 60 or 70 or 80 or 100 or 200 pages or 250 pages that you're going to send them depending on what kind of thesis you're writing. 
And it's very hard on a reader's eyes to read single line spacing over a long document. It's really tough. Um, as an examiner, I can tell you that the theses that I prefer reading are 1.5 line spacing because it gives my eyes a little bit of a break. There's more white space around the text and that is much, much easier. There's research actually that shows this. It's much easier on somebody's eyes. So 1.5 line spacing. And then spacing before and after basically just means that, um, okay, so if you change this to naught, right, you could see it just squashes the text a little bit. But if you say before and after, you just want six, it just makes a little bit more white space. And then that's actually quite nice for the reader to have um, as, as your format. So this is what I recommend. This is not necessarily what you're going to want, but this is where you're going to set up your your template. And then if you want this to be the case every single time you open a Word file on your laptop, you will say set as default. Now, this box will then jump up and it says, do you want to set this for this document only or base all documents on the normal template? And now if I was writing a thesis, I would say, please base all of my documents on the normal template. I want everything I type on this machine to start with this template and say, okay. And there you go, look, it's done it. It's changed my document, right? So now it's got, it's changed the format for this, for this um, document. So <laughs> I'm not sure I actually wanted to do that, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, so this is, what, this is what we've done now. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to set up your page template, right? And then you have to remember that only actually counts for your laptop. So if you are typing on different machines, every single time you sit down to type, you're going to have to change that if you want it to stay the same. So my recommendation to you, and this is what I did, is I had a research journal where I kept a lot of notes as I was doing my research. And what I did was I actually wrote there, like this is the template for my table of contents. Um, so my first line heading is going to look like this. And my second line heading, I'll get to that when I get to point four. But I also wrote down, this is my page template. It's full justified. There's no indents. There's six points before and after. It's 1.5 line spacing. And I'm typing it in Cambria. I typed my PhD thesis in Cambria, right? So what I had there was that if I then had to change laptops halfway through the PhD, which some of you have to do, and you have to reset this all up, then you can you have notes that help you figure out how to reset it all up. So make yourself notes. Um, it doesn't have to be in a research journal, but just put it somewhere where you have access to it so that you have that information for yourself. Right, so that's page templates. Are there any questions about page templates? Let me try and make this, um, okay, so I can see. Oh, I still can't see the um, chat. I don't know what's gone on here. Zoom's not my friend today. Are there any questions or comments? Ah, there you go. Now I can see it. <laughs> okay. No questions or comments so far. All right. If you have any, please keep them coming and just pop them in the chat and we'll come back to them. Okay. Right. So then we're going to move on to look at page numbers. Now, before I do page numbering, I think I'm actually going to do number three, which is breaks. Because when you're writing a PhD thesis, when you're putting a long document together, okay, so now, I'm going to imagine that some of you are still obviously writing, so you're going to use the page template. Template. If you've already written things, you can do what I've done, which is you can actually go into the document and you can reset the page template, and then it will reset your document for you. Okay. Um, so you're going to be doing that. Now, when you get to a later point where you're actually going to need to start putting things together, you're going to need to start adding page numbers, right? Uh, Thank you, Renal. I'll come back to that question. Okay, right. So I don't know all the technical details, but you guys are welcome to ask. If I can't answer something, I'm going to ask YouTube to answer it for you. <laughs> okay, so if you've got all your chapters together, you're obviously going to need consecutive numbering, right? So you may well have numbered your chapters for your supervisors just so that they could say, um, a CPA on page six, there's a problem and you need to come back. So, you know, you, you might have done some temporary numbering for each chapter, but each chapter then will start at one and end at 25 or 36 or whatever it is. Hopefully you don't have chapters that are too much longer than about 30 pages, but whatever. 
you'll have individual chapter numbering. Now you've got to delete all of that because you actually now have to have consecutive numbering from one all the way to, in my case, 196 in my PhD thesis, or I think it was about 85 in my master's thesis, right? You might also want to do that thing that you've seen people do where the preliminary information, so what we call the prelims, so that's your table of contents, your acknowledgements, your plagiarism declaration, if you have to have one, um, your abstract, uh, any tables of figures or um, lists of acronyms and abbreviations. So that's what we call the prelims. So it's all that stuff that comes before the chapters start, right? The prelims are often numbered in Roman numerals. So I, 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 V, et cetera. Whereas the rest of the thesis, like when chapter one starts, that's usually what we call Arabic numerals, which is one, two, three, four, five, the standard numbers that we know. In order to create that kind of numbering, you have to master section breaks. Because what Word does when it reads a document is it sees it as a whole, if you don't tell it otherwise. So if you start numbering at one, and you actually say, oh no, but I wanted you to stop numbering on page six and I wanted you to start something else. Word can't see that. It just sees a whole document. But if you break that document up using section breaks, Word will then see the document as sections and it will enable you to apply a different numbering system to one section and another one to another section because Word will actually be able to see that you've created two sections. So that's why we use section breaks. Right, so where do we find them? We usually find them under insert. Okay, so if I and I'm going to do, I'm going to exit my meeting controls again just for a minute so that I can actually see this. Right. So in Word, where you find all of these page numbers and things is usually under insert. Okay, so if you click on insert, this screen will open up. The page stuff is usually over here on the left might be in slightly different places depending on which version of Word you're using. This is usually where it lives, under this tab. You can insert a header and a footer. That's the little section at the top of the page and the little section at the bottom of the page that you don't type in. And page numbers are here, okay? You can also find it in the top under the insert. You can scroll all the way down to page numbers and page numbers will be there as well. This is also often where you find footnotes and things like that, right? Okay, so that's where we're working. Now, section breaks are what use these very sparingly. Section breaks are what you use when you want, for example, to break up the text so that you can um, change the layout of the page. Okay, so I did this recently with a document where I actually had a table that was so big that it needed to go onto a portrait, uh, uh, sorry, a landscape layout rather than a portrait layout. You, we usually type in portrait layout. That's the sort of short tops, long sides. Landscape is where you have short sides, long tops and bottoms, right? You flip the page. Now, if you want to do that in your thesis, say you've drawn like quite a big um, diagram or you've got a big image and it won't fit onto a portrait page or you've got a, a significantly wide table that you need to insert, right? Page section breaks are good for this. Section breaks are also very good for when you want, as I said, to, to separate the prelims from the rest of your thesis so you can do different numbering styles. You do not need a section break after every single chapter, and you never, ever, unless you're changing the page layout and putting in different sizes of figures and tables, you never need section breaks in the middle of chapters. I once edited a journal article that had 24 section breaks in it, and the thing was only like 18 pages long. So somebody there obviously misunderstood what breaks did and had used them incorrectly. So the breaks that you're going to need most often in a thesis are page breaks. The breaks that you're going to need to use more sparingly are section breaks. Okay, so I'm going to turn my auto formatting on. The other button that you all need to become good friends with when you start doing this kind of formatting is this button that looks like a funny little sort of character. And it's the show hide formatting button. So if you click it, you'll see all the formatting. So these funny little arrows here mean that there's been a tab stop. These um, little marks here mean that that's a space. And you can see here that I have a page break, okay? So I'm gonna now just quickly delete that. Actually, if Word lets me, Word doesn't often let me do this. And now of course it won't let me do it because you're watching me. This is typical. Okay, so you see now I've deleted all my chapters, my section, my page breaks. And now what Word has done is it's brought the beginning of my chapter right up. 
to the top. Okay, so this is often what happens if you try to use the enter key to create gaps between your chapters, right? So if you've done that, this is what you'll see. Every single time you press enter, this little character will appear, okay? Don't use enter to separate your chapters because what happens is that if you then come, so, okay, you've prepared your thesis, you sent it to your supervisor, you've done all of this lovely work, and then your supervisor says, you need to add three paragraphs to the end of this chapter, you don't have a proper conclusion. Then you add all of that. Then what happens? This happens. You then go down and then you're like, oh, now chapter four is starting on the middle of the next page. What happened? Well, because you added something to chapter three and Word sees this is a whole document. So what it did was it just shifted everything down because that's what you told it to do with all of your hitting of the enter key. So if you've got a situation where you finished writing, say this is chapter two, right? This captions, I'm gonna just actually take that out. So say this is the end of the conclusion of chapter two and now chapter three is starting. And you're like, oh no, now it's like in the middle of the page, what am I gonna do? Turn on this little button so that you can see all your formatting. Delete, 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 delete. You don't need any of these extra spaces. What you do is you put the cursor at the beginning of the heading for chapter three. You go to insert, page break, and you click that. And what it will do is it will move it down to a new page. Okay, so then every single time, even if I now go and add a whole lot of typing to this, right? So I'm typing and typing and typing. Chapter three will always start on its own page, nice and neat and tidy. So it doesn't matter how much typing you add to the previous chapter, chapter three will always start there. And the only way it won't is if you go back and delete the page break. Okay, so page breaks between chapters, really, really important. You don't necessarily want page breaks between it within chapters because what you're going to have is a bit of a mess, but you want page breaks between chapters. And in the prelims, you want a page break between the acknowledgements and the abstract. And you want a page break between the abstract and the table of contents. And you want a page break between the table of contents and the list of figures or whatever comes after it. So that everything has its own defined place within the document. So page breaks are your friend. Section breaks are something else. Okay, so let's say I now want to uh, have, I've got some diagrams and figures in here. Just bear with me for a second. So say, for example, I actually think I want to make this bigger, this picture, but it's not going to fit if I make it bigger because of the limits of my margins on this page, right? And we don't want to mess too much with the margins because we don't also want to make it hard for our readers to read our document. So what I can do is I can come here before the picture appears and I can insert section break. So here, if you go to insert at the top, you scroll down to break and you hold your mouse over that. You'll see there's a page break. These don't worry about all the other breaks. These are the only breaks you need. There's a section break next page. Now that means it will start the new section on the next page. A continuous section break means that it will insert the section where the section break where you're working and it will carry on on the same page, but it will be a new section. Usually, we want a next page section break. Sometimes we want a continuous page section break. It very much depends on the document that you're creating and where you want the break to be and what you want it to be there for. I'm gonna use a next page section break. Right, so if you look now here, it's got these two lines that denotes a section break. Okay, one, sorry, one page, one line for a page break, two lines for a section break. So what it's done is it's started a new section. Okay, now, I want to change the page layout just for this diagram. I don't want to change the page layout for the, whatever comes after the diagram, only for the diagram. So I have to insert another section break after the diagram so that word doesn't mess this up. And I'm really hoping this is going to work. And now I'm going to put a continuous section break because I don't actually want to break up my whole chapter too much. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to change the layout of this page to landscape and see if it works. Yes, there you go, see, it worked. Okay, so what you have to do, if you want to do this kind of thing, so now I can actually make this quite nice and big because I've got the space, 
okay? I didn't actually need to do that for this chapter, but let's do that for the sake of argument. So you can see there's my section break and there's my section break. Now, if I turn this off and make it all pretty again, what it does is it creates a section break there. It puts the table or the diagram or whatever on a bigger page so that I can show my readers in clear, you know, often this works like when you're trying to create a really long table um, or, or a diagram that is um, elongated lengthways. But you have to put the section break before and after the thing that you want to split out. Otherwise, what would have happened if I didn't have this section break is that Word would have actually turned the rest of the document, sorry, into um, landscape. It would have just done that for the rest of it because it would have gone, oh, well, this section is one thing and this section is another thing. So you have to tell Word what to do. Word won't know what to do otherwise, right? Again, like I said, it's not a brain. It's you have the brain. This is just a tool and you have to learn how to use the tool so that it can do what it is that you need it to do for you. All right, so that's section breaks and page breaks. I do also have a small video um, that I will, um, I'll send the links to a CP and she, or I'll try and put them in the chat a little bit later. So there are also a couple of videos that we made about this a few years ago that are on the Enhancing Postgraduate Education website. Oh, Enhancing Postgraduate Environments website. All right, so that's page breaks and section breaks. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about those? Um, Renal had a question about this, where it says, don't add a space between paragraphs of the same style. I don't actually know exactly what that means, to be honest, Renal. I think usually when I find, I don't actually, you usually don't need to tick the snap to a grid because you're not going to have a grid in your document. But usually I think what that means in my experience is that, um, if you don't tick this box, it might create different kinds of spacing sometimes between different paragraphs. Like if you change the if you change the font style or if you change the line spacing in the text. Whereas if you say yes, it doesn't actually necessarily change anything. Like you can see in the sample text, it doesn't really do anything. So I usually just tick the box to be on the safe side, but I don't necessarily know exactly what it means. So. I'm sorry, that's not a very helpful answer to your question. <laughs> but I don't actually know exactly what that means. Um, there's also, if you look, okay, so is there anybody in the room who's using uh, footnotes as their referencing style? Any footnoters in the room? Yes, no? because this might be helpful to you if you're a footnoter. Okay, you are some, there are some footnoters in the room. Okay, so the other thing you can look at, right, under paragraph is this is indents and spacing. So this is your line spacing, the spacing around your headings, uh, the spacing between your paragraphs, I'm sorry, and basically whether your text is justified. You can also look here at line and page breaks. And the one thing you want ticked is widow and orphan control. And the other thing you want to tick is Keep lines together because otherwise what happens is you might be typing quite a long footnote this is often for people especially who work in law and history but not only law and history um because sometimes people in english literature also use footnoting um it's usually used when you don't want to break up the text and you want the references there but they have to not be in the text itself right so sometimes people do this right widow and orphan basically means <laughs> that you've got half a footnote on the one page and then the other uh, the half of the footnote is on the other page. But the but the three, say it's footnote number three, that's on page two. But you've only got part of footnote number three on page two, and the other part is on page three. And you think, no, I don't want that. I want people to read the whole footnote in one go on page two and then move on to whatever's next. So that's for some reason word has decided, I don't know why, to call this widows and orphans. So the one thing is the widow and the other thing is the orphan. So widow and orphan control and keep lines together basically just means. It will see your footnote as a whole thing and it will adjust your, your page so that the footnotes can all stay together. So that if the number three is on page two, the whole of footnote three will be on page two, even if it's quite a long footnote. And then, you know, so basically your footnotes numbers and the footnotes stay on the pages together rather than being split up over different pages. If it's still happening to you, come back and tick this box as well and then say, okay. 
and see if that also helps. But you definitely want widow and orphan control ticked and you definitely want keep lines together ticked because that's going to help you keep your footnotes all together. Uh, footnotes are a pain. So if you don't have to use them because of your referencing style, don't. I would recommend rather, if you really have to have notes in your text, try and have end notes after each chapter because it's going to make your life a little bit easier. However, if you have to use footnotes, then you have to learn how to use footnotes properly because otherwise it is very frustrating experience for you as the writer and it's a frustrating experience for the uh, who, sorry, the word just went straight out of my brain. Oh, for the reader, for the reader, obviously, for your examiner, for your reader. Um, because they're trying to sort of look at the footnote and they're going, wait, where's the other half of the footnote? And then they've got to turn the page. Or if they're reading it electronically, they're going to scroll down and then scroll back up again. You don't want to make more work for your readers, right? That's one of the key guidelines for any writing you do ever. You want to not make more work for your reader because the more work your reader has to do around silly things like this, the more exhausted they get right reading your document and that's not an experience that you want to have as a reader so it's certainly not an experience you want your readers to have right especially if they're your examiners so we want to make it easy for them all right so that's page breaks and section breaks now we can talk about page numbering right so one of the things that this is obviously as i said useful for is to do different kinds of numbering now page numbering often defeats me so I'm really hoping that it doesn't defeat me and make me look stupid today. You can see I don't have any page numbers in this document. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do is two different kinds of numbering. So I'm going to imagine that everything before the section break that I've inserted is the prelims of my thesis. So I want Roman numerals and everything after that is the actual body of my thesis. So I want Arabic numerals. So what you do is you go to the start of the section which is here, um, okay? And you say, insert page numbers. And then this box will pop up. You all know this box. I'm sure you've seen it all before. So then you need to decide, do you want the page number at the top of the page or the bottom of the page? Neither is right, neither is wrong. It's a style preference. I personally like putting it at the bottom of the page and I like my page numbers centered. Another nice thing to do, however, when you're writing a long document is you can do an inside outside thing. Okay, so basically, as you turn over, the page number will be on the outside and then on the inside and the outside and the inside. You can see here the little, little tiny black square down there is the page number. You can do that as well. I like centered. Um, I want to show the number on the first page in this instance. And I want to go to the format and just make sure that. Um, I've got the number format right, so I want Roman numerals, I don't want Arabic numerals, um, and it, this is a default tick, you don't have to necessarily worry about that right now, because there isn't a previous section, right, I'm imagining this is the first section, so I want to start at one, okay, so let's try this, okay, okay, right, so it's done that. It's read from the first page break and it says this is page one, this is page two, this is page three. So let's go down to the section break and hope that this has worked. Ah, okay, right. So what it's done is it's managed to go up to page eight, but it's done this thing, it does this to me all the time where it's carried on numbering. But now it's changed it to Arabic numerals, as you can see, because it's reading it as a separate section. But we don't want this to start at nine now, we want this to start at one. So sometimes it works if you just, okay, so what, what I did there was I double clicked on the page number. So that meant that I've highlighted the footer of this page. So the header is at the top, the footer is at the bottom. And the quickest way to get to headers and footers is just to go to the bottom of the page or the top of the page and double click and it'll open it, right? So now my header and footer thing here my my bar has opened at the top okay so i want to change the page number right so i can go here to page number and i can say format page numbers and i can say start at one don't continue from the previous section because then you'll see it as nine being the first number i want one to be the first number please let this work and you say yes oh it worked and now it's going one two three, four, okay. And this one is still Roman numerals. 
So <laughs> if it works, that's as easy as it is, right? You just got to do a little background work first, defining your section breaks so that you tell Word how to read your document. Okay. Now, Headers and footers are quite cool things to know about for your cover page. Has anybody ever had this experience before? You make a cover page and you put page numbers in and there's a number on the first page and you don't want the number on the first page because you don't know how to get rid of it. I can show you how to get rid of it. Okay, I'm trying to show you how to get rid of it. Let's say this is my cover page. I don't want a number on my cover page. I want the first number to be after my cover page, not on my cover page. So one of the things that you can do, right, is you can come here to your header and footer bit. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did there. Okay, so this is my cover page, let's imagine. I don't want this one here, okay? So what you can do is, I'm trying to escape my meeting control so I can see my screen. Okay, you can come here to layout. It's usually under layout. Is it under layout? Or is it under design? See now, was it under review? Sorry, I just have to find it again because I always lose the stupid headers and footers. Okay, no, you know what? I'm just going to do my shortcut. I'm just going to double click, double click so that this pane appears, header and footer, okay? And I'm going to say I want a different first page. I don't want the same first page as everything else. I just want a different first page and the number will disappear and the next page will start at two. If you want this page to start at one, you're going to have to create another section break here so that it can actually start at one. But I, you know, we sort of assume that the first cover page is page one and the next page is page two. And actually it doesn't really matter as long as your table of contents is correct. It doesn't actually matter what your page numbers are. You could start numbering at 100 and go to 200 or 300 as long as your reader can navigate your document using an accurate table of contents. Right. So that's kind of how you do page numbers, right? Um, ideally, oh, Sandy Swiss says mine did not disappear. Hmm. Uh, I see Per, Wanda is struggling with this sound. Wanda, sometimes it helps if you um, leave the meeting and come back in again quickly. Um, that sometimes helps with sound. Otherwise, it might be your machine. I don't know if anybody else is struggling with sound or if it's just Wanda. Um, otherwise, you need to maybe, where the, where the button is at the bottom that says, I don't actually know what it says now because I don't have my meeting controls, where it says mute and start video, there's a little arrow next to mute. And sometimes if you click on that, it'll tell you like what you're using. Um, you should be using um, your, um, the, the, yeah, it'll say what your microphone setting is and what your speaker setting is. And you can test your speaker and microphone there and see if maybe it's your sound. Otherwise, sometimes leaving the meeting very quickly and coming back in also helps to re resolve sound issues, I found and um, maybe give that a go. Okay, right. So I don't know what to say about that, Sandeepa, because if you follow this format, it should disappear. So my idea, my, my suggestion there is maybe just try again. So put the page numbers in, but the thing is you have to have a page break. So I don't know if you have a page break, but you have to have a page break between the cover page and the next page in order for it to actually see that you've got to break it up. OK, we are recording this and you will all have access to the recording. And usually what we do is we put it onto our YouTube channel. So you're all going to be able to access it on our YouTube channel after this and watch it as many times as you like. OK, right. So that is according to the plan. Breaks and page numbers and page templates. Right. Do you have any questions about this other than trying it and then it didn't actually work? OK, the thing is also, so this way and everybody else. You're going to have to play with this and it's going to require a little bit of patience because these things don't necessarily always work the first time. That is the first time I have ever done that and it worked the first time. I promise you right now. Usually I have to do it three or four times before it works. And sometimes, and this drives me bananas about Microsoft Office, sometimes there's hidden formatting that even this little button that shows you the formatting doesn't necessarily show you. So sometimes the document has just got something embedded in it where it just 
has decided it's got its own ideas about how the world should be and your ideas don't matter. Um, that is also often what happens when I'm working with somebody on a document and they've typed it on a different computer and they've sent it to me and they've done something funny with their formatting and then I have to try and figure out. If you're working across machines, that might also be part of your issue. So one of the things to do is obviously Google it, have a look on YouTube and see if there's a video to help you. Just literally type in, why is my computer doing this to me? <laughs> um, I typed that in the other day. Why is my computer creating all these stupid folders? And actually, there was quite a lot of help out there. Unfortunately, the help hasn't worked yet, so I'm still figuring it out. But there's a lot of help on the internet. So please do also have, have a look at that and give it another try. See, if, follow the steps again. Make sure you've got your breaks in the right places and then give it another try. And if it's still not working, then Google is your friend. YouTube is your friend. And if YouTube is not your friend, then you need to also ask somebody else for help. Usually somebody who has knowledge of editing these things. Okay, so now I want to show you the holy grail of auto formatting, which is the table of contents. If you are writing a document, that has a number of chapters and a number of subheadings. You want the automatic table of contents. You do not ever want to be doing this manually. It's a waste of your time and energy and there's no reason for it. Okay, so there are a few things that have to happen before you can even do an automatic table of contents. If I try to do on this document now, it would be blank because I haven't told my document that it, there is anything to put into the automatic table of contents. So what we first have to talk about is automatic headings. Okay, so now this is where your style comes in. You have to decide what you want your style to be. So what we're gonna talk about really briefly is heading levels. So when you look at a thesis document, okay, let's say here, chapter three, a relational approach. Okay, so say this was the heading of my chapter. This would be heading level one. The title of your chapter is heading level one, okay? Then say, for argument's sake, that this was section one, introduction. Okay, I don't actually want automatic numbering. Thank you very much. You can go away. No, sorry. I just have to have a quick fight with my computer. I don't want automatic numbering. How do I make it go away? Restart numbering. No, usually it gives me a little thing here where I can just tell it to shush. Okay. Okay, let's just say, <laughs> for argument's sake, this is introduction, right? That would be heading level two. Now, if I had a subsection um, here, just saying um, theory, uh, theoretical tools, I'm just going to make some stuff up here quickly. And that was actually section 1.1, but I don't want to do automatic headering. So I'm not going to press enter because otherwise this thing is going to fight with me. So let's say that was 1.1. That would be heading level three. And then if I had a 1.1.1, I would have heading level four. I'm going to strongly recommend, unless you absolutely have to, that you don't go past four heading levels. The reason for this is that you are then going to make your life very, very complicated. Because if you have 1, 1.1, 1.1.1, that's four heading levels. Sorry, actually, that's four heading levels. You don't want 1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.2. Editing your document is going to be a nightmare. The other thing I really want to say really quickly about heading levels, because often um, students don't necessarily realize this. They kind of like people say, oh, you have to have headings to break up your text. Otherwise, it's too much to read. Yes, that's important to understand. But headings aren't just um, tools to break up your text. Headings actually communicate meaning to your reader. They communicate a hierarchy of ideas, right? So if you have a 1.1, that says to your reader, this is not a section on its own. This is a subsection of section one. It's part of section one. It's connected to that. If this, for example, then was number two theoretical tools, it would say this is on a par with section one in terms of importance in the structure of this paper, right? It's this whole new section. But if you have section two and then you've got 2.1, 2.2, and then you've got 2.2.1, that third heading level says, this is not big enough information to be its own section. It's not even big enough information to be a first subsection. It's a second subsection. I'm breaking down the information into finer detail. I'm giving you more information um, about this bigger topic, right? So if you're going all the way down to like 
2.1.1.1.1. Why do you need such fine grained information? You might not. And if you're giving a heading to one paragraph, then you also need to be thinking, does this, is this actually a section or is it just a paragraph? Does it really need its own heading? Or can I actually incorporate it into another section that has a heading? Because you don't also want to go overboard and have like a 17 page table of contents because you've just got a million headings. You want to use your headings really carefully. And every time you use a heading, you want to ask yourself, do I need this heading? What is the purpose of this heading? Is this a main section heading? Is it level one, level two, level three, level four? Why is it a different level heading? How does the structure of my text actually, how is it unfolding? So ask yourself that about heading levels rather than just sort of seeing them as this technical thing. They're not really a technical thing at all. They're a meaning making device. Everything in writing just about is a meaning making device. Okay. So, right, we're going to have a look at this now. So you've got heading levels. I want to actually just try and create a couple more heading levels um, just so that we can figure out how this table of contents works. We're going to make that number two. Um, and then I'm going to make like, a, just for the sake of argument, a 2.1. Um, I, I don't have a heading for it. So I'm just going to, but I want that to be bold and italics. And then I want like a 2.1.1, um, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. And then I want this to just be italics. And then I want like a, let's go to a fourth heading level, 2.1.1, uh, me. Right. So now that is going to be underlined. So. What I've done is I've already created a little bit of a style sheet here for myself. So my first heading level is just bold. Regular size text, 12 point, same as the rest, bold, okay? My second heading level, so this will be heading number, heading level number two, will be uh, bold and italics. Then my next heading level will be just italics. And my final heading level will be just underlined. So visually, you'll be able to see that there's a hierarchy in my text. You have to create the style. The heading levels can't do that for you because you're going to tell the headings what they need to look like. Okay. So then we're working on the home tab here. Home tab. Okay. And we're working on this bit here, which is the style pane where the headings are. You should always be typing in normal text. Normal text is the default for Word. Okay, so you can also obviously as part of your style um, template, you can modify this, but essentially this matches the style template that I created at the beginning, right? It's norm, its name is normal, it's in Times New Roman, it's 12 point, there's no bold or underline or italics, it's an automatic, which means that it's black, the text is black, it's not in a color, automatic means it's black font and you'll see it says it's got 6.4 6 point after widow and orphan control so that's what i set up it's justified that's my font that's what i set up right at the beginning of this workshop right you can add this to your template that's quite a nice thing to do because then it means that every document that you write in this computer will match that template okay if you wanted to change it you could come down here to format and you could then change all of these kinds of things. You could go back to paragraph, just like we had before. The same screen pops up. You can make the adjustments here and then you click OK. But that's that's your basic format, right? We want to now move across to where it says heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, and so on. OK, so this we're going to turn into heading one. But before you just highlight something and call it heading one, Word has already decided a format. Usually it's in blue, okay? Don't know why you would want a heading in blue. Generally speaking, you want all your text to be in black, black ink. Um, it's also cheaper to print in black ink than it is to cheaper to print in color. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna come here to heading one and we're gonna modify all of our heading styles before we then start turning our document into something that can be turned into an automatic table of contents. So the first thing you do is you right click and you say modify. Okay, then this page opens up again. You can call it whatever you want. I usually just call it like heading one, but you can call it the chapter heading. So you know, like this is the heading for each chapter. 
okay? This leaves the rest of this as it is. The style will be based on your normal template. You want it to be based on your normal template. You don't want to do any other funny things. But now look what it's done. It said, well, we're going to put this in Calibri and size 16, and we're going to make it blue. No, no, my document is typed in Times New Roman. I don't want to go crazy. 16 is a bit big. I want to go one step higher than the text. I want it to be in bold because it's a chapter heading and I want it to be in black text, please. Okay, so what you can then do is see, okay, so here it's got 12 points, which is quite a big space before, but then no space after. You want a bit of space after a chapter heading. So I would come here to paragraph, open up that page and then say, I'm gonna go 12 point before and after. Um, I don't want any indenting. Uh, on my chapter headings. I want it to be justified. It's heading outline. Now you see this will change to outline level one. This is your first heading level. Okay. You want before and after. Tick that just in case. Um, it, it actually changed the spacing a little bit on this one. It made it a little bit neater. And then I'm going to say, okay. Okay. So I've set heading level one. So now if I highlight this and I click on chapter heading, it'll change it. Okay, so now it's turned it into a chapter heading. All right, so now we're gonna do the same thing for the other heading levels that we need. So you come to heading level two, you click modify. You see, it's done this thing again, okay? So now I want to actually call this one heading one because this is going to be like my one introduction, two, etc. It's gonna be that level heading. Again, I want it to be in Times New Roman. And I now want it to be the same size as the rest of my text. So I want it to be 12. I want it to be in black ink and I want it to be bold. I don't want two point spaces before, that's a bit weird. So I'm going to add this to my template. I'm going to also click automatically update because then this will help you update headings and documents that you've already written. Everything that it reads is this heading level that will change for you, okay? But I'm gonna come here to paragraph and I, I want six before and six after, because I want a little bit of space around this heading to make it stand out a bit. I do not want it to be indented. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right, that's fine. You can keep it as heading two then. So sometimes Word will do that. And my advice then is just to change it back to whatever it was before. Try not to pick fights with Word. It almost always wins. Okay. So then what we can do is we can highlight this and we can click heading two and it'll change it into heading two. And then if we come down here, we can turn that into heading two, okay? You might have to add that numbering yourself later. Don't worry too much about that right now. Uh, here again, heading two. Okay, so all my headings are changing according to this format that I've, I've created, right? So this will also be heading two. But now I want to also deal with my other headings. So I need to now find heading three. Now, the question is, where is heading three? Style pane. Hmm. Okay, so here we go. Heading three, right? So now I want to modify heading three. So I'm going to say modify style. Uh, I'm going to call it heading three because Word says I should, and I'm not going to pick a fight with Word about this. Now, this heading was bold and underline, remember? Okay, I'm gonna do the same things again. Take those boxes, come here. I'm gonna make a smaller space. I'm gonna have a bit of space before the heading, but no space after the heading, because I think it looks quite nice. I'm gonna say, okay, ooh, double check. Did I have that indented? Oh no, sorry, clicking on the wrong things. No, no, no indents, thank you very much. I don't want any indents in my headings. Okay, okay. So now I've modified heading three. And then finally, before I move on, I want to modify heading four. And I want to make that same thing. Automatic times New Roman size 12. I don't want any italics, but I do want it to be underlined. Here's my little preview. Um, and then I think I'm actually quite happy with that spacing. That'll be fine. So, okay, right. So now you'll see if you open your style pane, it'll actually show you what your heading levels look like, right? Um, because it's adapted all of the things that you wanted um, it, it to. Um, okay, Tandeke, thank you. You can obviously watch the rest of the recording. Thanks for being here. Okay.
So mm -hmm, we're going to go back here. We're nearly done. This was a heading two. So I'm going to come back up here to the other headings that I created. This I'm going to now change into heading four. See, it's indented it. So now I've got to fix that. So this can also help you figure out whether you've got mistakes in your style. And you can come back here and fix them, right? Um, this is also why it's a really good idea sometimes to do a trial table of contents because sometimes doing a trial table of contents will also show you where you've made mistakes in your headings. This then is going to be heading number three. Hmm, interesting. I didn't want that to be bold, did I? I wanted it to be plain. So I'm going to come back here and fix it quickly. Okay, there you go. Good. Yes. All right. I'm happy with that. Okay. So now what I've done is I've modified my four heading styles. If I really had a fifth level heading, I could come here and do the exact same process to modify the fifth level heading. Okay. Um, yeah, Sarah, you can, I think the way you do this is by adding them to your template and then by working off your template. Because then if, you, if you're working off a template and every document you open and work on has the same template, it should transfer your heading styles across. You shouldn't actually need to set these up on every single document you work on. But that's why working with templates is so important because otherwise Word can't see that it's the same style that you want. It just treats every document as a brand new document that needs its own whole thing set up. So yeah, setting up templates is key. That's the first thing you've got to do. And every time you do anything, you've got to make sure that Word sees that it's part of the template. Otherwise, it won't necessarily um, see that you're doing the same thing that you were doing with the other documents. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you how to put in a blank page. Because what often happens is that you've done all this work and then you go back to the beginning and there's nowhere to put your table of contents. So one of the things that you can do is you can put in a blank page. So what I would do is I would go to where I want the blank page to be, put the cursor right there at the start of the page and then say insert, whoops, I'm sorry, insert blank page. And all Word will do is create a massive page break and just basically shift everything down a page, okay? So what you can then do is insert your table of contents in this blank page. So come to the top of the blank page, put your cursor there. And where you're gonna go now, is you're going to go to references. This is where it is in Office 365. I cannot for the life of me remember where it was in older versions of Word. So you might have to click around a little bit, but this is where it is in Office 365 in both Windows PCs and on Mac. You're gonna to go to references. References is where you, you can use your citation function. So this is Word's inbuilt version of RefWorks or EndNote, um, which you can use. Um, this is also where you can insert footnotes and insert endnotes. This is also where you can learn how to insert automatic captions, which I'm still learning how to do. And this is also where you can do an automatic table of contents. So what you want to do is you don't want to just press table of contents. You want to click on this little arrow next to it because you want to do some formatting first. So you want to go to custom table of contents. This is really important. Go all the way down to custom table of contents to make sure that this pane opens because the default setting in Word is only to show three heading levels. So if you have more than three, you'll be confused because they won't show up in your table of contents unless you tell Word to read all of the heading levels you've created. So if you have five heading levels, you want this box to say five. If you want, if you have four heading levels like I do, you want this box to say four. Okay. You also have a number of, you can choose the from template. So from template means your table of contents will be in Times New Roman. It will be one and a half line spaced. It will be in black font. If you choose one of these templates, it's going to change the font. It's also going to change the spacing. You can see the, um, the, the uh, examples here in the box next to it. So I don't actually want to do that because I don't want to have to fiddle around with reformatting my table of contents. I want to use the same template I've been using for the rest of the document. So I'm going to say I want four page levels. I want to show the page numbers. I want the page numbers to be aligned with the right. I'm not using any links. So actually, I do want to use links. Click use links. I'll tell you why in a minute. There are no tab leaders. I don't need to worry about that. I quite like what that looks like. I'm going to click OK and give it a try. And that is what it looks like. 
that's not exactly what I want it to look like. It's on an indent in it. Now, why it's done that? Why? Because my format has got a first line indent. Okay. So, don't like that. It looks ugly. I'm, oh, can whoever's got their microphone on, please turn it off. You're making very loud noises. <laughs> okay. Um, so, actually, what it's done is it's created this, this indent. And I don't want it to be the indent. So, I'm going to reset my thing, my template, and see if maybe I can get it to work a little bit better. So, I'm going to go custom. Just check that everything's there. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's a little bit better. But now it's still gone and indented these because that's part of the format. Okay. And I don't obviously have spaces because I didn't put a space there because I didn't want it to do that. Stop automatic numbering. There you go. All right. So that's now. So you see, sometimes you have to fight a little bit with Word. Um, it's unfortunately part of the deal of now why aren't you not working? Now you see, it's gonna make me look bad in front of you guys because, <laughs> ah, and I haven't added this one to the template. Let me add this to my template. That's probably why it's not working. Okay, so what you can do then is create this automatic table of contents. Now, this is another thing that I want to show you, right? So say for example, you've made some changes. Maybe you've added some things so your page numbers have changed or you've actually added in a section so maybe you've made this now is actually 1.1 1 .1, um part i'm just going to put this here right so may sorry somebody's got their microphone on sorry you're making quite a lot of noise and it's um, a bit distracting so if you could please turn make sure your microphone's muted that would be very helpful so i'm just going to put this in here and then I'm going to change that now that was heading three I think is that right or heading two no it's heading three okay so say you've added some headings now obviously you're going to come back up here but it's not here because you've changed your table of contents so what you can do is you can right click and you go down to where it says update field and you click on that and this box will open and we'll say, do you only want to update the page numbers or do you want to update the entire table? Now, if you have not added any sections, but you've just done a bit of extra typing here and there and it's shifted your page numbers, just update the page numbers. But if you've added things, like I've actually changed section headings and I've rewritten some of my headings and I've done that kind of editing, you want to update the entire table. So you click that and you say, okay, Word will reread the document and it will change your table of contents. Okay. So if you come here, and I've seen this in documents people have sent me to edit, and often it happens with the references, and sometimes it's just how you highlight things and how Word reads your formatting, but sometimes you'll have things in the table of contents that are actually part of the text, and if that happens, what that means is that that part of the text that Word is reading as a heading has actually been misformatted, so then you've got to jump down to that section, this is why I say use links. Because what that means is that when somebody's electronically reading your document, if they think, oh, there's a, or if you're formatting your document and you think, oh, no, 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 that's a mistake. You don't have to scroll down 65 pages to get there. You can just click it and Word will jump you straight there. And you can think, no, no, that's a mistake. It's supposed to be um, that, right? I made a spelling mistake, right? So then you come back up here, you go back to your table of contents and you say, Please update field, update the entire table. Please reread my document and fix it. And it's fixed it. Okay. Automated table of contents is a game changer, really, for working with long documents. It absolutely is. Because otherwise, oh my word, the amount of time you will spend fighting with your computer to make a nice, neat, tidy table of contents. And every single time you make a change, you have to reread your entire document and write down page numbers on a piece of paper and then go back and no, 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 no. <laughs> like, don't do that to yourselves. Right. So essentially, in theory, the same basic process is followed for creating citations. But I haven't quite worked out how to do this yet because I had a master's student who I was helping um, edit her master's thesis. And when we tried to modify her table of figures, um, it actually ended up deleting her table of contents. And for some reason they were linked and I couldn't figure out if that was a word feature or if that was just something she's done. So maybe we can do a backup workshop or a second workshop down the line where we do like, you know, 
more ingrained stuff where we look at like citations and and um, we look at uh, captions, figure captions. I I think doing an automatic table of captions is a very useful tool, especially if you have lots and lots of them. I mean, I probably had about 20 figures in my PhD thesis. So it actually would have been really useful for me to know how to do that. Um, but I have also just recently done a book and I had probably about 28 figures in the book and I just manually did the, the figures because there aren't that many of them that it's so difficult to scroll through and to see which pages this on. And what I did was I then, I literally did this. I typed the, the like, this is like figure, I did this, I typed figure one, um, point one because it was in chapter one, it was called blank page. And then I put the cursor here and with the tab function, which is that little arrow um, with the line after it, I just tabbed it across and then I typed like, okay, that one was on page two. And then that way, if you use the tab function, instead of the space key, all your numbers will line up, right? You do not ever want to be using the space key. If you're pressing space more than once, you shouldn't be using the space key. Space is really just for spaces between words, spaces after punctuation. It's not for anything else. That is the space key's only job. If you're pressing enter like two or three times, you're pressing enter too many times. So if you're pressing enter to try and get your chapter down, stop, delete all of that, go use page breaks. If you're using space, 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 space to try and move, for example, if you did this, Right, so I can tab back. If I'm pressing the space key, I'm not going to get a nice straight line because Word doesn't know how to format that. I might, for example, get a nice straight line there. Then say, what if this is number 13? But now I don't have a nice straight line, right? So if I press space to go all the way along, it's going to knock out my numbering. And if you're doing this over the course of a long document, it's see, that's not quite right. But if I use the tab function, it's also very easy to get back because you only have to press backspace four times instead of 100 times. So if you just go tab, 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 there you go, that's nicely lined up. And now I want to undo this one because I want to tab it back, tab, 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 there you go. So to line up things nicely, so learn how to use the tab key, seriously. Right, Amanda Cox, if you're at the end of the thesis and you haven't used the template from the start, how would you recommend combining the chapters to ensure the correct formatting? How would you integrate the documents? Yes, I would open a new document and copy and paste chapters. I would, that's absolutely what I would do. So what I would do is I would open a new document. I would set up the template exactly the way I wanted it. I would set up all my headings. I would then copy the first chapter across. Um, uh, I would then double check that it's done the template properly, that it's got all the spacing that I need, and then just quickly go through and go heading one, heading two, heading three. You've seen, look, this is, there are much more technical ways of doing this. There is this tool that you can use in Word, for example, called the master document. I cannot for the life of me get that thing to play with me nicely. I just, I end up spending so much time fighting with a tool that I don't completely understand, that if you actually did it a tiny bit old school, you would have more control of the document and it would actually in the end save you a lot of frustration, even if it's not necessarily technically quicker. So how I did it was exactly what you're saying. So how I integrated my documents, I had all my different chapters, obviously I'd written them. Um, I then had to show my um, supervisor the whole thesis. She actually showed me how to do templates. So I had been using a template for most of the documents, but even when I put it all together, she said, you've got some weird spacing stuff going on here. Like this chapter has got really big spaces around the headings. This chapter has got different spaces around it. You need to go and fix that. So what I did was I did it using these tools. So I highlighted the sections that I needed to fix. And then, so what you can do is if you feel like, okay, you know what? That doesn't look like my format that looks like something else. What you can do to find out what Word has done, how has Word formatted this, is you can highlight the section that you want to check. You can go to format, go to paragraph. It will then tell you, oh, actually, this is your format. It didn't. It is your template. It didn't look like your template, but it is your template. If it is not your template, the information here will be different. It might, for example, do that, right? instead of 12 and 12. And then you'll think, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. Actually, I've got to change that, right? So then you can fix your template here. But what I did was that 
the template that I set at the beginning isn't the template for this document. I typed this document on a different template. But by going to the beginning of this document and changing the template, I changed what this looked like. It did automatically update it. Okay. Yes, so, then it did. so that's what I would do is I would open a new document, get all the formatting right, copy and paste your chapters across, and then you've got the whole document. Then you can actually double check all of your spacing, all of your headings, all of your page numbers, all of your section and page breaks, all in one document. And you've got to give time for this. It is not a quick thing, right? Um, you, when you get to the end and you are preparing your thesis for submission, you've got to give yourself a minimum of a week to like get it all together because you don't want to do it all in one rushed morning and then miss things. I like to format in layers. So I'm like, first, I'm going to do all my headings and check that. Then I'm going to go through and double check all the spacing. Then I'm going to go through and double check. I don't like to check too many things at once because otherwise I, I miss stuff. And then and then I'll like, now I'm going to go through and, um, oh, Sarah, no, I just avoided the automatic numbering because um, I didn't want to do it in this particular document. I don't have anything against automatic numbering personally. <laughs> I think automatic numbering is very, very helpful. But sometimes... I mean, I'm one of those people who doesn't like it when my headings are indented. I like my headings to be aligned with the right margin. And often when automatic numbering kicks in, it wants to align things. It wants to indent things rather than align them with the right margin, which just irritates me personally. But no, you should use automatic numbering. Automatic numbering is also one of those incredibly useful tools because especially if you've got a number of heading levels, automatic numbering, Word will help you keep track of that. I will say, though, that having worked with a student at NTU last year on putting his thesis together, we did the thing where he copied and pasted his chapters across and we double checked everything. And not all of his automatic numbering carried on chapter to chapter. He did have to go back and do some editing and fixing. So you do have to maybe do some editing and fixing with automatic numbering sometimes. None of this is perfect. Word does not necessarily get any of this perfect. Um, and often the mistakes that Word makes is because of mistakes that we have made with setting Word up. Because Word can only read the document the way you've told it to read the document. Um, and it can only work according to its programming. It can't do more than that. Um, so if you're using Word, I think it's also important to realize that Word does have limitations, especially when you get to very, very long documents. It's not the most stable platform for working with very long documents. But if, you, if you're towards the end and you've been using Word all along and this is just going to like upgrade your use of Word, then that's great. Don't try and learn something new now. If you write at the beginning and you really don't like Word, and you, you have time and energy to learn a new platform, a word processing platform, by all means do that. But you're going to have to go through the same process as we've done here of figuring out how to set up a template, how to do all of this stuff so that you can get the software to work for you rather than against you. It's basically, basically the um, point, I think. Get the software to work for you rather than against you. And there are some very helpful tools. And just one reminder, this is a magic button. If this doing something weird and you don't know what the formatting is, click on this button, get it to show you the formatting. And then you'll be able to see where the spaces are that there shouldn't be and where the bullets are that there shouldn't be. This little black square appears when you've got an automatic heading level. So that's just a, a diacritic mark to show you that. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments before we close? I don't know. I, I figured this was the usual 90 minutes. So we've probably got about 10 minutes left for those of you who can stay. But otherwise, if you break up a document into different sections, will the style then No. No, if you break up a document into different sections, it won't change the formatting for each section, Fancy. The, the template will stay the same. The breaking up a document into different sections is really just to help, actually, mainly, I think, with page numbering. And then also with things like... Um, this sort of thing where you want a different sized um, diagram or something like that so that you can change the layout of the pages but not change it for the whole document just change it for some pages and then obviously get accurate page numbering going especially if you've got different sections but you can see um, that I've done this and I've, I've created section breaks and it's still the same format that I had um, before where I have an indent and I have 1.5 line spacing and it's in Times New Roman and it's full justified. It hasn't suddenly changed this um, format radically. Yeah. 
but again, you know, this is, oh, and this is another quick tool I wanted to show you just before we finish, because um, I, I have recently discovered this and it is brilliant. So one of the things that I really find difficult is to, you know, if I scroll, 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 I can't always remember what I saw on the previous page. And then I'm like, did I see a space or didn't I? So if you go to view, right, and you go to this here where it asks you, how much do you want to zoom the page to? So I've currently got zoomed to 150% because I'm old and I have bad eyesight. But you can also reduce the, the font size, I mean, the, the zooming size, so that you can see more of the page. So you can see where there are mistakes that you don't like, and then you can go and fix them. But always fix them with the tools. So if, for example, I'm going, why is there such a big space here? There shouldn't be such a big space here. I'm not going to try and backspace or anything like that. I'm going to highlight the section. I'm going to come back to format, paragraph, and I'm going to go like, what's gone wrong? Oh, okay. All right, it's a 12 point thing, but actually I didn't want the indent. I wanted something, so I'm going to take the indent away. Okay, good. I fixed it. All right. Don't try and fix things manually. Try and fix things with the tools. Okay. That's one thing. You can also do this. You can say, I want to see multiple pages. So I like this when I get to the end of a document and I'm just quickly scrolling through to make sure that all the spaces are correct and everything's where it should be. And then I can see three pages next to each other. You can almost do it. I think sometimes with six pages, but three is usually as much as my eyesight can take. And then I can actually go, no, that space shouldn't be there. That's in the wrong place. That space shouldn't be there. I want that at the top of the page. Yes, that's perfect. Oh, look, extra space there. Why is that? No, okay, that's the section break. Leave it alone. Um, okay, wow, that's a lot of spaces. I'm not entirely sure why those are there. Those can go away now. You know, so you can fix it like this. And then it actually just makes your life so much easier than trying to sort of see it one page at a time, right? So that is actually a very, very useful tool that I very recently discovered and thought, man, why did I not know about this when I was doing my PhD? <laughs> because it would have made my life so much easier if I could have just had, you know, three pages next to each other all at a time and just quickly gone through at a glance as my final check to just make sure that there aren't weird spaces where there weren't supposed to be weird spaces and headings. You know, you never want um, a, a sort of a subheading at the bottom of a page and then the text to start on the next page. So then even if that's in line with your format, you can still just quickly press enter, enter, move your heading down, make sure that your document looks exactly the way you want it to look before you press print or before you turn it into a PDF and submit it to examiners. Okay, um, yeah. If I have time, could I repeat how to give numbers for preliminary pages and others? Um, Adan, it'll be on the recording and it's quite early on. I don't know if we do have enough time to go through that again, but essentially that's where you learn how to do page breaks and section breaks and where it is in terms of changing the um, page numbers is here under at the top insert and then you go down to page numbers. This box will pop up, go to format. And that's where you tell it, I want Roman numerals or I want Arabic numerals and I want you to start at one or I want you to continue from the previous section. Very much depends. Usually when you're numbering between chapters um, and you don't have any page breaks, it will just carry on numbering. But if you wanted to stop numbering, you usually want to tell it, start at six, start at five, start at one. So that's actually where all of this happens here in page insert page numbers, format page numbers. And then okay, okay, and it should do it for you. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we close? Otherwise, I'm going to hand back to Asipe. Asipe. Hi, hi, Doc. Um, back to you. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful um, session. And I mean, I echo um, all the other sentiments uh, that were shared um, on the chats about how great it is to find ourselves in such a space where we learn about these things two years, three years after we've done and submitted so many, um, you know, this is his master's right. on this research project. So at least I, I, I hope that those who found this um, workshop useful will actually do um, 
sort of like a form a formal reflection also on the evaluation link and also um there's so many people in the chat that are thanking you dog and oh, i think i can see that you're yes. all very very welcome yes, yes, i think yes. sometimes mm -hmm. it's partly a problematic assumption on the part of supervisors and and mm. people who think you already know how to do this um mm. i do sometimes mm. feel that mm. when i ask my students you know do you know how to use these functions i worry sometimes that i'm patronizing because mm. of, you know but i didn't know how to use these when i did my masters at all yeah. i used none of this when i did my masters and i only yeah. learned how to use most of it because my supervisor said you're doing weird things with your spacing don't you know how to use mm. templates and i'm like i'm sorry mm. templates can come again mm. um so you know you you also have to sometimes be brave enough to ask um yes. you know if you don't know how to use something don't assume that because you don't know how to use it that's stupid and everybody knows how to use these things most mm. people have no idea all the things word can do i don't even use all the functions on word because i haven't learned how mm. to use them yet like i told you i'm like learning how to use the caption function now because somebody also mm. said to me did you use auto captions for your book no I didn't even use the reference citation manager. I did the referencing yeah. manually. So there's still some things that I'm learning. Yeah. yeah. Like re referencing managers is going to be my next thing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and there are probably people going, oh, how could you have done a whole PhD and not use RefWorks or EndNote or mm -hmm. Mendeley or Zotero? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have the emotional energy to learn it. So mm. I just did what I knew, right? But they yeah. are, they are, they can be magical. They can also drive you crazy. But mm. you know, you just have to also figure out that that this learning also takes time, and you've got to give yourself time to learn those things. And you've also yeah. got to not be afraid to ask questions because you're yeah. not stupid if you don't know, and you're also not alone if you don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I've learned even in this workshop as well that. Um, there's a lot of things that um, are not discussed when it comes to understanding how the computer works for no. people who come from different backgrounds where they first see a computer and how to use it in university. And often they are given a short space of time, a semester or a mm -hmm. term, to do a module in computer, which these things are not being dealt with. So most of us, nobody's wrong here, most of us have learned how to use computers, Word and, and any other, um, actually through Google. So thank you so much for being our human guru today. <laughs> You're very welcome. I've never been called that before. That's actually really nice. I want to put that on my phone. <laughs> and actually showing us how to do this. So colleagues, thank you so much Great. for all the attendees, the participants, and yes, the recording will be sent on email for those who want to download the video via Zoom. And also we will send a link to the YouTube um, page so that you can see where the recorded video is. And please have um, a look at all the past workshops as well if you didn't yes, want to go to yes, them because all of our yes. workshop seminar sessions from the last couple of years are all on our YouTube channel. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you so much. Again, apologies for not turning on my video. I promise you I still look good, but <laughs> <laughs> technology has been a thing. So thank you so much. I'll now stop the recording and save it um, thanks everyone take care thanks thank you All right. bye, bye.